Hi hey guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 364, featuring part 4 of my interview with the Dr. Cat. In this part of the interview, he talks about making Ultima 6. Uh, we talk also about Ultima 7. Uh, the problems that programmers had back then with all the uh, different sound cards and how that ended up getting uh, resolved with uh, DirectX. Uh, we also talk about some behind-the-scenes uh, stories, some fun anecdotes about what it was like working at Origin Systems. Uh, with Richard Garriott. Really fun stuff. I think you'll really enjoy that. Anyway, we've got a lot to uh, cover here, so without further ado, here is Dr. Cat. I, I always prefer to stay, for reasons like that and many more, in the creative and technical side and not, not caught up in the business side, although I think I would have made a lot more money if I had developed my business skills to be even you know, a fraction as sharp as my development skills. And I'm, just, I'm trying to work on it some more, but uh, it's not what I love doing. And the less need there is to do that, the happier I, I get. That brings us nicely to Ultima 6. You know, we mentioned this game a few times. So. Uh -huh. I noticed you, you've got quite a few credits on that one. Uh, credited for yeah. packaging, documentation, writing. I mean, it seemed like you're pretty much doing a little bit, maybe a lot of everything on that game. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm I'm really baffled how I got a packaging credit on that, <laughs> and whether that's a mistake yeah. or you know I I do like to say I've done every job in the game industry, programming, design, art, sound, music, play testing, manual writing, advertising copy I've written. Um, do you like you all know, this producer. equally, or are there certain things you really? I think you said you hated oh. the business side, maybe. But. Yeah, and and I am lousy at art. You know, uh, I did art in the early 80s because that was the one man does a game thing. All, all my games now are done with art by actual artists who draw stuff, you know, a million times better than me. So you won't you be seeing much of a, you know, I, I did one self-published thing where uh, I did a little pixel touch up on some hearts that were on the screen. I wanted anti-aliasing to be in home computer software really bad in the 80s. And it came along and, you know, I did a little early anti-aliasing. Lucasfilm did. Um, it's a good thing. But... <laughs> Very standard now in, in software, built into operating systems and their font routines and stuff. But anyway, um, so I might have written some box copy that ended up on the, the Ultima 6 box. I don't know. Also, I was very good friends. Uh, it used to be the art director. Before we got Dennis Lube to do computer game graphic art, we did have a small art department that just did the ads and packaging. And uh, Lori Agwulu was a very good friend of mine. Um, she was she headed that and and she came in to apply for the job. She was like seven or eight months pregnant, you know, uh, uh, really big tummy, you know, just just a bundle of energy. And um, I spent a lot of time chatting with her and introducing her to different fantasy and science fiction artists. And she said to me once, Kat, you are my eyes. And I thought was I was so flattered to hear that from an artist, because unlike all us making games, she didn't have a big science fiction and fantasy background. Um, but, yeah, there were. Um, uh, she didn't end up moving down to uh, Austin, where Austin uh, origin shifted entirely to Austin uh, after those early years in New Hampshire. Uh, and we got, you know, a production art department as well as the game art department. Um, but, yeah, I, I forget. I think I think we may have made that shift by the time we were doing Ultima 6. They worked with me on, on like, uh, when we were setting up the origin clue book, which was uh, the Ultima 6 clue book, which was a lot of fun, which I could go into. But, yeah, Ultima 6... Uh, Lord British said to me um, that he felt I knew Ultima 6 better than anybody else alive, including him. Wow. Which um, I don't think I could claim that. I mean, not only have I forgot some details, I'd have to go find and look up again. But um, some of the Ultima Dragons internet chapter, the, the fans, uh, like Cranberry Dragon, um, did a, a couple months long uh, Ultima Trivia Challenge where she had other people in the group. And I got on there. I, I like threw her a, a, a question about an Easter egg. I put in some of the Ultima 6 conversations, which, which I think she knew. Uh, she challenged people, uh, asked me anything about any Ultima, and I have 24 hours to answer. And she's just an encyclopedia. And she and the other fans, they, they write things in runic 
which, you know, Richard could do back when he was making the Ultimas. I don't know if he still can. I had to struggle through decoding stuff in unit in Runic or putting it into Runic if I had to for the games. And now they send me fan letters in Runic. I'm like, <laughs> well, thanks, but what did you just say to me? <laughs> do I want to know bad enough to go? You know, and I always do. I always like, you know, find a dictionary, look it up. But it's, uh, uh, it's difficult for me. One of the Ultima fans, uh, there was a, a little get-together at a local restaurant um, of some Ultima fans, some of whom were visiting California, some of whom live here. And this guy wrote a book on the Ultima runic language, and, and he gave me a copy of it. So I asked oh, him to autograph. book on it, wow. Yeah, I love getting fans to autograph stuff for me and turn that on its head. In Fercadia, you know, our, our players are our creators of the world, and we try and treat them that way. When we go to conventions and they get our autographs, we have our little Fercadia autograph books we put out for people to have, and we each keep one, and we get a lot of the players to autograph and even draw sketches in there. So, um, But yeah, Ultima, Ultima 6, I was, you know, um, uh, past, you know, just doing the, the conversions, which is technical but not creative work for the most part. Uh, I was head writer. I was full blown into doing design and creative work. And uh, um, even when when we got to the point where, OK, the game's pretty much done and we're trying to polish off all the bugs before shipping, uh, our regular QA department was finding the QA bugs. Uh, Manda, my partner who created for Katie with me, I, I like to brag. She's one of the other few people who has done every job in the game industry, pretty much design little bit of programming, not much, but she's a very good artist. And she's done, you know, writing, playtesting. She did music for Runes of Virtue. She'd never composed music for anything before, period. And I was leading the Runes of Virtue team. She said, could I try composing a piece of music for the game? I said, yes. So we have a few pieces of music by the Fat Man, great professional musician. I love him. Your friend. And one piece of music by Manda, which I have to say, sorry, Fat Man, his best work is better than anything <laughs> she could do. In that particular game, I think her song, the cheese song, first thing she ever composed in her life, brilliant, great fit for the game, best piece of music in the game. Uh, but yeah, when we got to the last few weeks, it's like, okay, we need to ship this by March. Um, I sat down with her. It's like, well, let's QA all 250 NPC conversations. So I had the, the scripting source, and she would sit there and play the game. I'd say, okay, now end the conversation. Now talk to him again, but this time answer this other way. Now say this at this prompt. So I made sure we went through every code path of the conversation script. And we shipped with like one or two conversation bugs. I felt bad about it. But there were a lot more bugs in the C programming. And some of them would corrupt your save game files. So I'm like, eh, by comparison, my bugs weren't so bad. And we got them fixed perfectly in the first patch. Uh, sadly, it was like a second or third patch before all the code bugs got fixed. We had never done at Origin a PC product before Herman Miller, you know, went and learned the PC, you know, hardware and software and operating system calls. And he did, you know, he was the primary coder on that. And boy, he had a lot of sweating to do to fix the bugs after launch. We had never, to me, it's a funny, it, it's coincidence, but is it really? In the 80s, you could ship a game with zero bugs. And I'm confident most or all of the games most of us shipped literally had zero bugs. We had been every over every inch of that assembly language. And there weren't operating system interactions to worry about, or most systems didn't have interrupts. The Commodore and Atari did. Um, there was, you know, you knew what was going on. And the operating system, unless you had a custom DOS for copy protection, which a lot of people did, you'd like use the DOS from from the you know computer maker just to load your game and then throw it away to use that memory for graphics and stuff. All the memory was stuff you made, and you knew it all, byte for byte, and there were no bugs. The PC, too complicated, and now we have Windows and third-party drivers and everything. The arrival of Windows was also the arrival of us at Origin making games with bugs in them and shipping with bugs. And it's just because we crossed that that you know complexity threshold. But I miss it. I miss being able to ship bug-free software. That must be uh, agonizing to ship a product that you know has yeah. bugs in it. Yeah, well, for Katie, I had one line to play a MIDI file so I could have music in my game, right? Games like to have music. I had some. Team Fat gave me seven, you know, great pieces of music. All four of the guys, the Fat Man and his three cowboy composers, uh, chipped in. And uh, I put these seven files in there in the download package. One line, MCI send string, quote, play file name dot mid, comma, zero, comma, one. I, I checked the zero and the one were right. And... 
depending on what sound card you had and what drivers, if you like went to a web page that had background music, which was also MIDI's in those days, and the sound card was asked to play two things at once, the sometimes it would work fine. Sometimes it would play one and not play the other. Sometimes it'd try and play both. But sometimes it would freeze up sound, so the sound card would play no more sound until you rebooted your PC. Sometimes it would lock up the app or lock up the whole computer. Because I had this one line, which was a correct bug-free line, but the underlying software it would go talk to, whether from Microsoft or the third-party sound card manufacturer, or maybe they're having an interrupt conflict between their sound driver and a graphics driver you have, and it was a nightmare. And, of course, Microsoft's attitude was if sound card manufacturers put out any imperfect or buggy drivers or buggers, drivers that could have conflicts, they should correct that. I'm like, no, they can't. You can't expect that to realistically happen and not happen from all of them for all their drivers for all their cards. Only Microsoft has the money and power to survey these dozens or hundreds of cards and work out a way to make it all work and fix it. And I, as a game programmer, have two choices which are unacceptable. Put music in my game and have it freeze the sound or crash the computer for a number of my players, which is not acceptable to me, or have no music in my game. Those were the only two choices. Third choice would be become John Miles, get every sound card, say, forget their their MIDI playing call. I'm going to write MIDI routines and drivers for every sound card in the universe, which was possible but prohibitive in time. Once John did it and published his library, then the option is, well, pay John for his library and use that instead of Microsoft. But eventually Microsoft built it. But the fat man got me in touch with the guy at Microsoft and charged his sound. I made my case. I'm like, look, you guys have to fix this. This is the only way it will get fixed. And otherwise, no game can reliably have music. And it, you're just not a, a platform for entertainment software. And that should be unacceptable to you. And it's like, no, no, we're not going to fix it. I don't, I, I don't see it that way. We shouldn't do that. And we're not going to do it. Like, I got to, a chance to what talk to What the heck was their argument against that? Uh, again, I could see his point of view at the time and why I thought it was wrong, but I could see how someone could think that. But, I mean, looking back, it's it's just so wrong. I can't even reconstruct for you what the, <laughs> what the line of thinking is there. And I think it goes along the lines of, no, those are third-party hardware products, and they really must and should be responsible for their drivers, and we're not going to take over and, and, you know, pay the expense to clean up their mess. But really, I think it would have been to Microsoft's advantage, though it would have cost a pretty penny. You know, they could afford it and it would have made for a better operating system and a better computing platform, which, you know, if they had been looking a little more ahead or the people with the purse strings had, you know, maybe they could have seen that. And again, years later, through DirectX, they did come out with sound drivers that would, gosh, you can play music on any PC and not crash or freeze the sound card, no matter what sound card you have, you know, and, and like plug and play. This whole thing is like, Oh, well, yeah, there's a lot of hardware manufacturers, whether it's a flash drive or whatever thing you're going to plug into your PC. We're going to recognize as many of them as you can and have Windows just spot it, install a driver because it noticed it was plugged in. Instead of this whole users have to find drivers, whether it was the CD that came from the manufacturer, or the floppy, or you download it off America Online and users make mistakes and it asks you to set up, are you using Interrupt 5 or 7 for this car? And it's like, Oh, if you pick wrong, things are going to crash, you know. No, plug and play was a good idea, but that was years later. They weren't ready to get that high quality at that point in, in like, you know, uh, was it 94, 95 when I was talking to them? I forget. Uh, maybe 96 or 97. Um, some, somewhere somewhere in the 94 to 97 range. But, yeah, they, they started to get there. and then, uh, But, again, even plug and play – didn't solve it for audio. DirectX, not DirectX 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. It was like DirectX 6, I think, was when they finally fixed audio so you could reliably play music in a game without fucking up. Better late than never. <laughs> well, speaking of somewhere in that 90s range, uh, you know, at what point did you decide to found your uh, Dragon's Eye Productions with uh, Amanda? Yeah, so uh, I came up with the name in the 80s, just like the concept of the MMORPG. Uh, I was at a Renaissance fair, and I saw the, these beautiful paintings. It was like a section of a zebra's face with this very striking eye and some zebra eyelashes and the bold stripes. And you could get one of them, or you could get two of the left and right eye and hang them with a space between them and have, like, you know, a zebra face staring. It was a striking composition. 
And I thought I would love a picture like that, only with Dragon's uh, Dragon's Eye to be the, my logo, and I'd be Dragon's Eye Productions a Game Company. And when I start a game company, I will name it that, but I will put it off as many years as I can possibly manage, and eventually I'll have to do it because it'll be the only way to really do things the way I want and get everything right. And um, I, I, you know, I put it off like a decade from the '80s, and I think I was right on all counts. It was a pain in the ass, but I did have to do it to make the the games I wanted to make and do things the way I wanted to do them. Um, so yeah, I like to brag. Manda and I were the first ones to quit Origin and start a new game company before it became a fad, which uh, <laughs> that happened enough times. I think it's fair. Um, years later at Origin, some of the people who were still there made up this gag certificate for uh, the Origin School of, of you know, uh, interactive computer game design or something like that, like Origin Academy. Like it was a school and not a game company. And it, it, it boasted on their certificate, you know, our graduates have an excellent placement record at other game companies, you know, <laughs> or at game companies. But it was true. A lot of people, you know, entered the industry through Origin and then got jobs or started other companies. Um, there were a number of them started by ex-Origin people. Cinematronics, who I did some contract work for, for my friends there. Um, Digital Anvil, just all sorts of them. Uh, but we did it first. Uh I uh, I was going to stick around for Ultima Seven, but um, they uh, they were going to like uh, pay me as an employee. They want to bring all the contractors and freelancers in as employees. Was a decision they made in like late early late eighties, early nineties somewhere. And at one point, I was the last contractor, and everyone else was an employee. Manda was an employee, um, and. Uh, um, Richard or Dallas asked me, um, and I think it was Richard, why, why do you want to be a contractor? I said, well, you know, you never paid any programmer salary as high as what I'm making as a contractor. And I want to keep, I want to keep getting paid this amount. It's like, oh, okay. And then, you know, I said, if, if we brought you in as an employee and we paid you that same rate, but as a salary, would you be willing to do that? I said, yeah, yeah, I would do that. Um, so, uh, after uh, uh, I did Ultima um, 6 and I did Ultima Runes of Virtue, uh, and they said, oh, you know, um, uh, you know, since you've been a writer and not a, a, a game programmer, you know, writers get less pay. I got paid less on Ultima 6 than I got paid on projects I was programming on. That was, you know, agreed up front. Um, we're going to hire you at, at, at like a writer's rate. You know, even though, you know, I did everything that I probably would have been doing more programming and stuff. But I was going to be head writer of Ultima 7, to be fair, was going to be my next project. Head writer on Ultima 7 like I was head writer on Ultima 6. Um, so uh, they they generously offered me this lower salary than had been discussed before. And I said, OK, see ya. And I walked out of Dallas Snell's office. He was VP of product development. And I walked over to Manda's office. And when Manda showed up at Origin, it was clear to everyone she was weird. You know, I used to be the weirdest person at Origin. I'm not sure that was still true after they hired Manda. But it was also clear to everyone, Kat and Manda are on this same kind of weird wavelength. They communicate. And the first project she was put on was working on Windwalker with me. After Windwalker, there was never ever any question or any discussion. Whatever project we were put on next, they always put the two of us on the same project. For, you know, forever after. They could tell that that was a good idea. So I walked from Dallas's office over to Amanda's office. I said, let's go to lunch. And we went out of the Origin office in, in uh, Wild Basin Road near the Wild Basin Wilderness Preserve. We went and got lunch. I talked to her. She came back to the office and put in her two weeks notice. And um, she worked there another two weeks. Her last day, she fired up the Lux Paint, which we used for most of the art back then. Great program. Oh, yeah. And she drew a dolphin looking in through a porthole into like a room you were in and the, some nice lighting effect from behind. And she she typed on to the picture of the caption, so long and thanks for all the fish. <laughs> and uh, she walked out <laughs> of Oregon. And we started Dragon's Eye Productions and uh, um, still running after 25 years, which... You know, I'm impressed with Don Daglo. Don Daglo kept the development company Stormfront Studios running 20 years, which is very hard. You know, developers are, you know, very hard to keep running, very volatile, uh, often very much at the whim of the publishers and their willingness to advance you money for the next project or not. 
you know, a publisher decision, a whim of a publisher can just erase a developer uh, as a company from from the earth. And I've seen it happen many a time. Um, uh, it's that Ellen Guan's development company lived at kind of the the pleasure of Microsoft and Activision, I think, were their two main clients. And then one of them changed their mind about an upcoming project and like, oh, scramble to find another contract. Whoops. OK, let's shut down. Which, which was sad. Very good people, very creative, and, and you know, you want to see them succeed. But yeah, uh, we've kept running 25 years by just refusing to cost anything. You know, we're just committed to make stuff when we're able to and have money. We go get other jobs. We still call ourselves Dragon's Eye. We still keep Fricadia going. Um, and it pays for itself. You know, it brings in enough money to do that. It used to make enough money to pay us, too. It doesn't right now. Maybe, maybe someday again, uh, with, if I'm developing good PR skills. And we're, we're putting out all these great new features. We put our 32-bit version out in August, uh, which, which people have been wanting for years. So uh, next is like web and mobile clients, uh, mm -hmm. which, again, we've been wanting out for years. People have been wanting them for years. We'll, we're, we're working on that next. So, But, uh, yeah. Um, I'm a little curious. So, you said earlier that you and Amanda were the, we the weird ones at, at, at Origin. What, what, what kind of stuff did you get up to? Oh, boy. Uh, I mean, we could do the whole interview just on, on <laughs> anecdotes from origin, practical jokes. Practical More jokes. British came from a family that would play practical jokes. The brothers and sisters on each other, the parents on the kids, the kids on the parent. Owen came back from flying in the space shuttle. Uh, and Helen, they still would quarantine astronauts for a month back then uh, in case of space germs. And by this point, they know oh, astronauts aren't going to have diseases and space germs. We've flown out. But they were still doing it just in case. And your wife could go into quarantine with you so they didn't have to be without their husband for a month, right? So the kids knew from his Skylab mission, they're going to put all us up in hotels and mom and dad will be in the house for a month. So if we make a mess, they'll have to clean it up. They won't be able to stand leaving it that way. For, so they brought the neighbors over to help them. And they went to the supermarket and they bought all the toilet paper that the supermarket had. <laughs> and they toilet papered the furniture and the doors and everything in the house. And then they went outside and they're throwing rolls over the house. And they toilet papered the tree in the front yard. So Owen came back from, from space to an entirely toilet papered house. This is the kind of stories Richard wow. tells I want to see, I've told my version of when I caught Richard with one of his own tricks in his spook house one year. I want to see if Richard will tell me his version of the story as he saw it, which I've never heard him say. So that, that might be fun. But yeah, um, yeah, I had this purple fuzzy elephant watch. It was a watchable. <laughs> and they were made for little kids. It would barely go around my wrist. It's like clinging to the end bit of the Velcro and threatening to fall off at any moment. But I thought it was fun to have this purple fuzzy, and you like pull its head back. There's more Velcro there, and there's a little watch underneath. And so Richard starts the Austin office, and he's telling all the programmers how eccentric and weird I am. And he goes around with this purple fuzzy elephant watch all the time. And so I come down there, and they're expecting to see the watch. And I just didn't feel like wearing the watch for a couple of weeks at that point. And Richard was like, you know, giving me a hard time. Like, I told them all to expect the watch. And you showed up and they just like formed an opinion of you without the watch. And, oh, he's just kind of a normal, cool guy with a sense of humor. And then you put the watch on. It was too late. You know, you weren't what I sold them. <laughs> yeah. But some of the stuff they did after I left, I, I heard about from friends. or They did a little origin newsletter. Um, Richard went to CES. Back before E3, CES was where new games and video games would premiere and, and new game uh, consoles and stuff. So Richard was off at CES, and these guys, um, they filled his office with styrofoam packing peanuts. In fact, they shut the door, and they found a way in through the ceiling. They removed one of those removable, you know, kind of foam ceiling panels and poured it in all the way up to the top oh, of the wow. ceiling and slid the panel back in. It was full of styrofoam packing peanuts. So these two programmers got to go to CES next year for the first time. They're all like, oh, we're going to road trip. We're going to see the new games, you know, be there when we show off our new origin game we've been working on. And Richard not only filled their offices with packing peanuts, he also <laughs> con contacted the place that had, you know, built out and customized the office building for them and had them do some new work, took the doors out of their frames and off the hinges remove the door frames and refinish the wall. So they'd come and there was just a solid wall where their office had been. <laughs> and um, <laughs> apparently you, you, you could tell the psychology of these two guys by what they did. One guy got a sledgehammer, smashed, 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 smashed a ragged hole. 
and the dug out the packing peanuts, got into his desk, sat down, okay, I can use my office again. The other guy stood against the wall and had one of his friends at Origin trace the outline of him with a pencil. And then he got like a, a jigsaw or a bandsaw, whatever. He like carefully sawed a hole, the shape of him in the wall. And then he got out the packing pants. So he would go to his office door and he would line himself up to match the pose he'd been in and walk neatly <laughs> through the hole, which nobody else could do. He was the only one who fit perfectly through the entrance to his office. But yeah, I had, uh, there were a bunch of big cardboard boxes that some stuff had been delivered in. And they were empty. I built myself a giant box castle in, in my office once. Uh, that was there for a couple months till Dallas said, okay, time to take the castle down. Um, they did, again, I, I regret missing this. This was after I left. But there was a, a river raft race in Austin every year, probably still is, where the point wasn't to get your raft across the finish line first. The point was to have the wackiest, coolest, weirdest, most interesting raft you could have. And, you know, Origin did a pirate ship one year. They did a floating castle one year, and they have, like, you know, 10, 20 Origin people on it. It's an enormous thing. It actually float with all those people on there. It was slow, but, you know, they, they, they like, win prizes in the coolest-looking raft category and stuff, and, and they have a lot of fun. Uh, and, and, you know, Lord British's spook houses were epic. If you ever get to interview him, do at least one question on the spook houses. Uh, I got to volunteer in them along with, again— you know, it started out with like dozens of Richard's friends. It got up to hundreds by then, literally hundreds, including people with professional theater and makeup experience. Uh, he had a special effects company donating lighting and fog machines to him. Uh, I helped John Miles. Um, Richard wanted, uh, he worked out with John, hey, could you build me a Tesla coil? John was, you know, uh, tinkered around with explosive and electronics in very dangerous ways back in Oklahoma and, and you know, kept it up for some years. So there was this cardboard tube, like three or four feet high, that was a form for pouring concrete for, you know, construction. But we, this tube was like the perfect thing to make the primary coil of a Tesla coil if you wound a lot of wire around it. So John got a spool of three and a half miles of copper wire, and he made this wooden thing that he could put the cardboard tube on and rotate it. It was a custom-built thing he made for winding the wire around it. And we had a four-man winding crew that John was supervising. I was one of the four guys that helped wind it. And he's like putting this shellac over it to like coat it and seal it to the thing and insulate it. And yeah, we built a million volt Tesla coil, which was used in a number of the spook houses. And uh, it would throw sparks like six or seven feet. Usually John would be the character who was electrocuted by it. And uh, <laughs> he'd, he'd have like a wire hidden under his monk's robe that ran to a ground. And he'd like hold up a key to a door or one year he was in an electrical chair with a, like a metal bowl over his head and it would throw sparks to the to the bowl, not to him. And again, the bowl was grounded. But you'd show up on this balcony on Richard's mansion and you see John is like strapped to this chair in his monk's robes. He's like, quick, set me free. You know, they're going to electrocute me. Guys, save me before it's too late. And as you're walking up to him before you can get up to where you might touch him and be zapped too, you know he had a little hidden button under one of his fingers and he'd press it and the, the, the coil would go off and shoot these impressive sparks and he would thrash around in the chair and then slump motionless and be like, oh, your guy would tell, I guess it's too late to save him, let's move on, you know? So yeah, um, it, was, it was a great place to work. And you know, we'd, we'd uh, uh, play games and uh, do company picnics out by uh, uh, Bull Creek Park at the stream and Frisbees and um, they, they rented a... Uh, um, a place that would come with a, a whole bunch of rollerblades and they were rollerblading on top of the parking garage once. And that was, the, uh, that might've been the first time I tried rollerblades, but yeah, it was, it was a very fun environment. Richard would have Epic. Uh, his birthday was the 4th of July. So his birthday parties at his house were also 4th of July parties. He did uh, Greek mythology once I dressed as a satyr. Uh, he did English garden party. Um, he did a Halloween party one year when he wasn't doing the spook house where he had this elaborate game where everyone was either a vampire, a vampire hunter, a treasure hunter, or a werewolf. And these characters all had different abilities and ways they could interact with each other. And there were little gems hidden all around inside the house and outside. And there were a couple safe zones where you could socialize, where no one could kill anybody else. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was quite a party. And that's all for this week's episode. 
Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, should be back next week with the... Uh, probably, it's, it's kind of up in the air at the moment whether I'll go ahead and go with the uh, fifth, uh, fifth part of my interview with Dr. Cat. Uh, I've got some pretty cool interviews lined up, uh, though, for next week, and I think one might actually, if it comes to pass, be a little time-sensitive, so uh, that one would jump up to uh, next week. And that, that one, by the way, would be with uh, JVC, uh, John Van Canningham, who uh, wants to uh, come on and talk about a new game project that he's been working on. I'm very excited to get to talk to him. Uh, but we'll see. It's you know you never know if these things will actually happen or not. So keep your fingers crossed, though. Uh, I'm also, by the way, be uh, interviewing Tim Lang here hopefully next week. I'm supposed to interview him yesterday actually, but uh, he had some technical difficulties, so we had to reschedule. But uh, Tim worked on a lot of the uh, Might and Magic series games as well, as uh, including uh, Might and Magic Nine. Uh, that should be interesting. I think he also did some uh, work on the Medal of Honor series. So anyway, uh, stay tuned for that. If you want to know more, you can follow me on Twitter or the uh, Facebook page for Matt Chat. And if you have questions you want me to ask, you know, just uh, send those on. Oh. Anyway, as always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much for your support of the show, supporting Matt Chat, keeping interviews coming like th these with Dr. Cat and uh, hopefully JVC and uh, Tim Lang soon. A lot of great content coming up, and it's all made possible by you. So if you're supporting the show, thank you very much. Uh, if you would like to support the show and haven't done so for whatever reason, uh, just go to that link in the show notes to the uh, Patreon site. It takes a couple of seconds. It's easy to do. All I ask is a buck per episode, and I think you'll like the show uh, even more if you support it. So uh, thank you very much, and please consider that if you haven't done so. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, let's see. Got a couple news items from good old Stig here. Uh, one is uh, Gabe, uh, Gabe Newell has a uh, teasing a new single-player IP in the Half-Life universe. And, of course, a lot of uh, Half-Life fa uh, fans have been waiting for this for a very long time, so this is uh, quite exciting. Uh, there's not a lot of details about it, unfortunately, at least that, uh, not that I was able to find. Uh, there's some speculation, uh, no shortage of the speculation, though. Uh, Probably, I think it's pretty likely, actually, it seems pretty plausible to me that it would be a VR game, or at least have a, a lot of focus on uh, VR. So, uh, anyway, we just don't know a lot. If you know something about it, please uh, chime in, uh, but it's something to keep an eye on, for sure. I don't know about you, I really liked uh, Half-Life 2. Uh, Stig also wrote in, uh, this is kind of cool, a Micro Machines World Series game, supposed to come out in uh, April. Uh, you remember the Micro Machines toys? I'm sure you probably played with them uh, if you're my age. Uh, little bitty uh, cars, little vehicles. Uh, anyway, this game uh, looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I always like games with the uh, little cars in them, so I'm going to keep an eye on this one as well. Uh, so anyway, thanks, Dick, for sending uh, those in. Uh, oh, and by the way, that Micro Machines game will be for PS4, Xbox One, and Windows. So uh, pretty good coverage. And then a Shane a Stacks of uh, Shane Plays wrote in about uh, Obsidian teasing a... lot of teasing going on? What is all this teasing? Uh, anyway, Obsidian teasing a Pillars of Eternity sequel. Uh, so if you look at this article I'll link to, uh, they're talking about some screenshots that came out uh, that make it pretty clear that they're planning a, on a Pillars of Eternity sequel instead of a, another Fallout game. Uh, so anyway, uh, we don't really know very much about it at this point either, but uh, I, you know, I like Pillars of Eternity, so I'll be looking forward to the uh, whatever it is they come up with next. All right, I think that'll do it for the news. Uh, as always, let me know what you think about those news items, and if you have items you want me to, uh, uh, to consider for this segment, just send those in again to Twitter, here on YouTube, or on the Facebook page. All right, what about that ale of the week? Ugh. Uh, well, let's see. This one uh, caught my eye mostly because of the name. It's called Castle Danger. Uh, dangerously Good Ales. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ode IPA. Uh, so it's Castle Danger Brewery. And this uh, particular ale is called Ode uh, India Pale Ale. Uh, it's pretty good, right, pretty uh, good size uh, right up here on the back. They talk a little bit about what an IPA is. <laughs> you probably know that by now if you've been watching the show. 
Uh, let's see. It is an ode. Oh, here's, here's one they call it ode. Uh, so it is an ode to all the great IPAs already out there, a true marriage of hops and loves. Something new, something borrowed, something owed. <laughs> Cheers. All right, let's see where are these guys from. Uh, Castle Danger Beer is unfiltered, unpasteurized, and should be kept cold. Uh, for a filtered beer, we suggest teeth. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, for, for a filtered beer, uh, we suggest teeth. For a coarse filter <laughs> or facial hair for, uh, for a finer polish. Uh, that's pretty good, guys. Uh, I like that. Uh, let's see. Brewed and packaged in Two Harbors, Minnesota. Uh, let's see, they say what alcohol content it has. Uh, not seeing any information about that. I could have sworn I saw it here somewhere. Uh, anyway, let's, uh, yeah, not seeing it now. Uh, anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Castle Danger Ode IPA here in the rather excellent drinking horn. And uh, you know, I've been smelling this. It's very hoppy, very citrusy, uh, maybe even a, a little bit of a lemon-like aroma to this. It's uh, This smells really, really nice, a really crisp uh, smell on it. Uh, makes you want to drink it, so uh, let's do so. Oh, <laughs> man, that one's got a lot of flavor on this, uh, on this Ode IPA. Holy cow, man, that really sort of packs a punch. Uh, let me give it another uh, taste here. Man, this one's uh, I'm really liking this. A lot of flavor. It's kind of thick and creamy uh, consistency. It's kind of uh, a little bit bitter, but you know, uh, it sort of balances out. I'm sort of getting a, a really strong a citrusy taste going down, followed by a sort of a bitter, uh, sort of a darker uh, finish on it. Uh, it's really interesting, actually. Uh, let me try it one more time here. Yeah, this one's uh, uh, really good. It's a, a little bit uh, shocking, I guess. There's just a whole lot of flavor here, especially if you're not used to a strong flavored ale. Uh, this one would probably knock you out. Uh, but if you want something a little more uh, aggressive, I guess we could say, I think this would be a really good choice. Uh, a little bit bitter, but just bitter enough to kind of keep it interesting without uh, that being unpleasant, uh, let's say. Anyway, I really like this, and uh, you know, actually, I can I can see the alcohol content now. It's kind of hard to see seven percent. Uh, so I guess that's sort of mid high, medium high uh, alcohol content on that. But I don't really taste a strong uh, alcohol flavor or smell alcohol all alcohol fumes or anything. Uh, anyway, I think this is a really really nice uh, IPA here. Uh, I've got no problem going a full five out of five uh, drinking horns on it. Uh, I drink a lot of IPAs, and this is one of the best I've had. It's, I'm really impressed. It's right here in uh, Minnesota. So uh, kudos to Castle Danger. Uh, I don't know how wide they distribute these, but if you get the chance, uh, definitely check out the Castle Danger Ode IPA. All right, let's wrap it up with a uh, quotation. I was looking for quotes about Halloween. <laughs> and it's actually quite a few to choose from, but this one... You know, I don't even know what this means, uh, so I thought I would just read it to you. It's by uh, Jean Baudrillard, uh, that's probably why. And uh, see what you think about it. It seems like it could be something really profound, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyway, it goes something like this. There is nothing funny about Halloween. This sarcastic festival reflects, rather, an infernal demand for revenge by children on the adult world. So <laughs> ponder on that and see you guys next week.
those micro machines that are all over in there.